You know, when I heard the applause when Greg came out, I, I thought maybe he was warming up the crowd. Um, also, Greg had told me this was a non-competing session, but he wasn't totally truthful uh, because the uh, Seattle Green Bay game is uh, running simultaneously with my presentation. So 10 things we can and must do better. I, let me just share a little reflection uh, from my side about the SCCM Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, first, some comments by my longtime colleagues and friends. Uh, one of my uh, senior faculty colleagues back at uh, my hospital, when learning that I was receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, said, does that mean you're old? But the best I've heard was when I ran into my good friend Luciano Gattinoni this morning, and he said, prepare to die. <laughs> so, uh, but I think in reality, uh, what the most important thing uh, this achievement award uh, forces me to reflect on is uh, all the people uh, that have inspired me, mentored me, uh, friends that I've made along the way that have been collegial parts of the things that I have done uh, to achieve that award. Many more than I can represent uh, on this picture. I knew this was an important talk for me to give and I look back on my long career of giving talks and some of my talks that were most successful uh, dealt with numbers. Uh, Ten Commandments of Critical Care, Twelve Mistakes in the Management of Medical Emergencies, and Ten Reasons to Use Norepinephrine Over Dopamine, which was my part of the pro-epinephrine and Jean-Louis Vincent uh, was pro-dopamine. And I bring that up because as I reflect on my career, I think my most memorable slide uh, came from that pro-con where I said some of my best friends use dopamine. <laughs> I know there are physicians, nurses, uh, pharmacists, uh, nutritionists, uh, all types of critical care, healthcare practitioners in the audience. Uh, most of my things we can do better are, are pertinent to pretty much everyone, but there are some are very physician-centric, uh, either because they're more physician things or because the physicians are where we can do better uh, versus others. So number 10... Uh, is better electronic medical record documentation. How's your day going? Great, only two more notes to write. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, that was not a central theme of conversation. You know, I find myself saying, you know, when are your notes going to be finished? You know, I've got eight done, got four more to go. I uh, still don't have the note. It's the end of the day. I want to go home. Uh, note's still not there. I can access the computer once I get home. But I think more importantly than that uh, is what was expressed in this opinion piece published in JAMA called John Lennon's Elbow uh, by Dr. Uh, Herstick. Uh, and what Dr. Herstick did uh, it's a very tongue-in-cheek, but very truthful about where we are with our EMR physician documentation, which is a lot of copying and pasting, sometimes with not good editing, notes that are written throughout the day with different time entries, uh, and uh, really a, a problem uh, with our notes, and notes tend to get bigger and bigger as the patient stays longer in the hospital. He broke the EMR note construction down into five stages, copy and paste yesterday's note, the computer places a time date stamp, uh, important, import today's vital signs and lab results, keep all irrelevant CTMRI reports and consultants' recommendations, 
update, update a few items. This step is optional, and I know all of us all of us see patients that are three days extubated that are still intubated uh, in the progress note and then sign the note. The title uh, of the article uh, relates to, to his comparison of our current status with EMR physician progress notes and a famous concert by the Beatles uh, and John Lennon's actions. This was at Shea Stadium in 1967. The first visit by the Beatles to the U.S., uh, in which uh, the Beatles performing at Shea Stadium to an incredibly large and loud crowd. And it was noticed by John Lennon uh, that no one could hear the music. Uh, the audience could not hear the music. Uh, the Beatles on the stage could not hear the music. And recognizing that, uh, he began to play his organ with his elbow. And no one could tell the difference uh, in what the Beatles were doing. And the analogy he draws is EMR progress notes are like music from John Lennon's elbow. They're awful and nobody seems to mind. And I think sometime in, in the not too distant future, this does need to be addressed. We must do better. Number nine, uh, patient safety, uh, another area where I think there's a lot of work to be done. Five million patients a year admitted to the ICU. $160 billion dollars of care delivered to patients. Yet this study uh, and many others demonstrate uh, the fact that our patients are clearly not as safe as we would like for them to be. Uh, in this study, per 100 patient days, 38.8 events were observed. And, and these events were called sentinel events, but they're a little different than what you and I would call sentinel events. Uh, there are things like uh, unplanned extubation, unplanned tube obstruction, medication errors, uh, lines that come out, etc. But it still points to the fact that, that our patients are not as safe as we would like. And if we compare it to other industries that have developed very uh, elaborate uh, safety systems, such as nuclear power plants, where three major accidents have occurred in over 15,000 cumulative reactor years, uh, we can see uh, where work needs to be done. And certainly there's progress that's been made. Uh, uh, institutions such as Johns Hopkins uh, have been a leader uh, with checklists uh, and other approaches to try daily goal sheets to try to improve, improve safety. Uh, but uh, if you look at our hand washing record, uh, and there's some publications there reference uh, hand hygiene, appropriate hand hygiene, we still have not been able to conquer something as simple as adequate hand hygiene. And therefore, I must say that we must do better in patient safety. ICU rounds. Uh, patient safety research demonstrates that poor teamwork is a causal factor underlying critical incidents in the intensive care unit. Y'all see the two players yet? Okay, you need to see two before we go on. Uh, a, a lot of uh, performance improvement efforts, uh, it's now become, you know, we've moved on from PDSA to Lean Six Sigma. Uh, as an approach to try to, to analyze what we're doing and to put think tanks together to figure out how we can do better. Uh, how do we match up the process with the problems? How do we get a multi-specialty approach? And this is very applicable to our ICU rounds, which should be very multidisciplinary. Uh, this is an example uh, of what was done at uh, Cooper. Uh, Dr. Zanotti and Dr. Treziak, but a lot of people involved, nursing, respiratory fellows, to create a high-level process map 
uh, looking at ICU rounds and how they interface going in with the huddle that takes place at the front of the unit every day with both of our full ICU teams, including the multidisciplinary components or representatives thereof, to look at you know, where are the patients that are having problems that need to be seen first, where are the patients that need to be moved out to create beds, <clears throat> followed by a very standardized ICU rounds, a brief presentation by the resident just to get everybody aware of why this patient's there. Uh, nurses, uh, for their patients, uh, presenting most of the information, what happened uh, over the last 24 hours, uh, what are the new lab, what are the things that need to be uh, addressed by the team. Uh, then moving into the room for discussion about assessment of plan, examination of patient, recap, and on the back side of ICU rounds, uh, standardization of uh, sign-out. Uh, this is our uh, checklist uh, that we use for each patient as we move forward. Initially, there was some concern uh, that this would prolong rounds. I think once we have gotten further into the process, uh, we believe it actually streamlines rounds and eliminates uh, discussions, multidisciplinary discussions that were really not necessary. We must do better. Number seven, physical exams. Is the physical exam a dying art in critical care medicine? The decline of the physical exam, uh, has it been forced out uh, by our reliance uh, for diagnosis and progress of therapy? Uh, based on the sophisticated technology that comes to bear on our ICU patients. Uh, uh, a lot of laboratory that we use, uh, do we still use the physical exam? Uh, is it still being taught uh, in the ICU? Uh, this is the critical care attestation that we use at the ICU at Cooper. Uh, I'm sure it's similar to what your CMS requirement attestation is. I, Richard P. Dellinger, have seen and examined this patient on such and such a date, important for both E&M codes and for critical care billing. Uh, and I, I think about, I, I do try to at least satisfy uh, the fact that I examined the patient uh, but how meaningful is it? Uh, and is it done just strictly to satisfy CMS attestation requirements? Or do we really think about a meaningful physical exam? And do we look for important findings so that we can teach fellows and residents and medical students? Uh, or perhaps many patients uh, get only a visual examination to satisfy that requirement. We must do better. <clears throat> Number six, aligning research uh, with healthcare changes. Um, uh, we have discussions at my institution about how do we maintain the research mission? How do we maintain research mentoring for residents and fellows? Uh, how do we have academic productivity from our hospital to satisfy uh, the wants of the medical school which we're affiliated with? Uh, are we losing ground in research uh, because we're pulled in too many directions? Uh, we may have RVU-based compensation plans. Uh, we may have our life chopped up into pieces where we look at our salary and we see it comes from I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do this, and that's my salary and that's my day. And what about my family life and my personal life? Uh, how do we uh, get the research mission pushed forward, moved forward, maintained uh, in our academic medical centers? I was glad to hear Craig Coopersmith today uh, feature in his 
uh, presentation this morning, uh, the, the Society of Critical Care Medicine's recognition uh, of the need to do more in the area of research with specific funding that was going to be applied. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, but another, it's not the total solution, but I think we can align. There, there are two ways to go. Uh, we can dig our heels in the ground and say that we're going down uh, because we just don't have time anymore to do the important research mentoring and research publications uh, and the original science that people will say is important for our field. Uh, or uh, another alternative is the go with the flow, which is the point I'd like to make with this particular uh, area of the talk, which is to align the research mission with healthcare delivery, uh, to look at what are we being required to do from a healthcare delivery standpoint, from a business standpoint. What are things we're doing that satisfy the business mission and governmental requirements? Things like quality indicators, length of stay, cost per case, and throughput. Are these important? Uh, will these improve patient care? Uh, is a mission of original science to do research that will improve patient care? I think the answer is yes. So mentoring our fellows and residents in projects related to quality indicators, length of stay, cost per case, throughput, will both allow teaching research methods, uh, mentoring junior faculty in research, and, and continuing uh, to carry on the mission. Now, we cannot totally digress where we're not doing <clears throat> translational research uh, and we're not doing basic research and we're not doing pure clinical care research that may not yield uh, uh, fruits uh, in our healthcare delivery. But I think it certainly will be useful and beneficial uh, in the research mission. We must do better. I'm going to move now and talk more about uh, ICU care issues and in particular start out uh, with number five, which is pre-ICU care and talk about the history of fundamental critical care support. Uh, in 1992 in San Antonio, uh, I came up with the concept of fundamental critical care support. The reason that this idea came to me was as an intensivist. I saw patients that were transferred in from other hospitals or transferred into the ICU uh, during the day or night before I had a chance to assess them. Uh, that had had non-critical care providers uh, make decisions that were very detrimental to that, pati that patient's care? And would it be possible uh, to create a course that would target non-critical care practitioners that might teach them some basic concepts and principles that could be applied uh, that would save lives? Uh, the Russ Raffley was the, the incoming president. Uh, Norma Shoemaker uh, was the administrative director. Uh, they listened to what I had to say. They thought it was a good idea. Uh, we got $10,000 begrudgingly from the council. Uh, one of the concerns from the governing council, now the board of directors, uh, was that we might be authorizing non-critical care physicians to practice critical care by giving them a merit badge. Uh, I don't think that's proven to be the case. Uh, Janice Zimmerman and Rob Taylor quickly came on board. Uh, we were the, the center uh, of creating the first uh, FCCS course. Uh, Tim Buckman, our new editor, I remember him sitting at the back of the first course uh, critiquing the slides. Uh, but with that 10,000 uh, FCCS push forward, and I think we're up to about the fourth edition or more, uh, the course is taught uh, 
throughout the world in more than 20 countries, more than 10,000 people take the course a year. Uh, but it's not enough. Um, there is too much need for critical care pre-ICU to satisfy with a two-day course. Uh, I don't have necessarily the solution, but I can offer you one example, uh, maybe as a seed for other thought. Uh, telemedicine uh, has been used as a way to project critical care expertise into other units where there may not be on-site critical care expertise to bring patient care uh, from a distance into a central area uh, where decisions can be critiqued and recommendations can be made. Uh, we can't do telemedicine uh, out in small emergency departments or on hospital floors at night where there's no critical care expertise. Uh, but I was struck uh, by this article last week in Wall Street Journal uh, looking at going more nano uh, with telemedicine-like uh, technology. The future of medicine is in your smartphone. Uh, this particular article talked about the use by patients of smartphone technology in order to present data uh, from a distance that might be analyzed and diagnoses made by healthcare practitioners. But I was thinking uh, that maybe there's application to critical care. Uh, maybe smartphone light technology uh, could be used in EDs or used on floors where it could be tapped in uh, either through software programs or through actual uh, critical care healthcare practitioners uh, to assist in the early management of critical illness. Uh, but I think we do need to try to figure out how to bring more critical care to the bedside early in the diagnosis of critical illness. We must do better. Number four, uh, post-intensive care syndrome. Uh, this is the term uh, that was proposed by our organization and I think much more uh, aptly describes what we're dealing with than previous definitions. Uh, again, I was glad this morning in Craig Cooper Smith's uh, presentation that he talked about some new efforts that are coming out by the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, recognizing this important need, or in my mind, this area where we can do much better. ICU sur survivor impairments uh, are now being reported more and more. Uh, it's amazing the years and years that went by uh, throughout my career where this was either not emphasized at all or de-emphasized. And now we're recognizing how an important an area this is and how overlooked and overemphasized. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder after ICU stay, physical impairment, cognitive impairment, mental health impairment, uh, all come to bear. Uh, with up to 25% of ICU patients uh, that can be diagnosed uh, with this syndrome or this occurrence. Craig told us this morning about an effort that the society is going to be launching uh, called Thrive. I, I don't know much yet about Thrive, but I'm very interested in finding out about it because if our organization is going to bring to bear um, uh, resources on this very important area, uh, I think it'll be very important, not only for us as members of this organization, but for our patients. We are making progress. Uh, we are talking about uh, trying to get restraints off patients, about uh, sleep cycle about orientation, about early ambulation, about the right choice of medication for our patients that are having either agitation or delirium or whatever matching. Uh, places like Intermountain Health uh, have done pioneering work with early amb ambulation. Uh, Vanderbilt uh, with delirium. 
but I think we all need to get on the bandwagon and with our organization, which is moving forward. And, and some new things like ICU diary, uh, it's now recognized that patients have very little memory of their ICU stay. Uh, and it's like psychotherapy uh, that they benefit from learning about their ICU stay. And either nurses or families or others can keep daily logs of important events that occurred to allow patients to relive their experience and to better deal with it. We must do better. Uh, most of you were figuring that I certainly would not get through this lecture without saying something about sepsis, severe sepsis, and the surviving sepsis campaign. The, the thing that I'll say uh, first is that it's amazing to me uh, what has come out of the surviving sepsis campaign. Uh, I can remember uh, having phone calls with Mitchell Levy and Graham Ramsey uh, as the three of us uh, brainstormed on this and then approached the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the European Society uh, with this idea of a campaign because mortality was high in severe sepsis. <clears throat> phase one was going to be the guidelines. Now, phase one was just... Uh, publicizing and getting the public and uh, the media to understand the gravity of the problem of severe sepsis. Uh, step two was the guidelines, and then step three was to decrease mortality. And when we uh, managed to get through phase one and phase two, uh, we looked at each other and said, oh my God, now we've got to do phase three. Uh, and we really didn't have any idea uh, how we were going to do phase three. Uh, and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement actually contacted us to see if they could partner with us uh, in a performance improvement program with sepsis bundles. Uh, it, the program has grown tremendously and is now uh, one of the hallmark programs for our organization in the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, most of you are familiar with the two recently published trials, uh, the PROCESS trial and the ARISE trial. <clears throat> Over 3,000 patients uh, comparing different uh, resuscitation approaches, early goal-directed therapy, PROCESS care protocol without CVP and usual care. Uh, I'm not going to get into anything having to do with how those arms differed uh, because I don't need to. Uh, all I need to do is say that there was no difference between those five arms. And the mortality uh, was 18 plus percent. Uh, that's to me is the take home message. Now, why is our mortality 18 plus percent in our academic health center, our larger hospitals that are capable of participating in clinical trials? Uh, I'm not going to stand up here and say that it's due just to the surviving sepsis campaign, but I think the surviving sepsis campaign can appropriately say that they're likely part of this decrease in mortality. Uh, but ARDSNET for ARDS, uh, even early goal-directed therapy back in 2001 uh, was a high-profile study that brought forth the importance of early identification and resuscitation. And I think early goal-directed therapy uh, is also important. The, early, the uh, Rivers paper, the ANAN study looking at hours to appropriate antibiotics, uh, again, awareness, uh, the various bundles that are present in our ICU, uh, DBT prophylaxis, uh, VAP bundles, uh, the AB, ABCDE, all these things. We, we just are improving ICU care in general, and we are clearly identifying patients earlier with severe sepsis. We're giving earlier antibiotics and earlier, typically more aggressive fluid resuscitation than we did. I believe in our academic centers and in our large hospitals, we have created a culture 
where indeed we may not need finite, specific, variable-related protocols. However, we should not rest on our laurels. If I look at my state of New Jersey, uh, these are mostly non-academic hospitals, and look at what the mortality for severe sepsis is in 2013, you see that almost none of the hospitals come close to that 18 plus percent. Uh, there is still a tremendous challenge ahead for us to spread this message out to intermediate and smaller hospitals about earlier identification, earlier antibiotics, and early, earlier fluid resuscitation. Sepsis is still a time bomb. We must do better. Number two, uh, communication uh, with patients and from patients to physicians, physicians to patients. Uh, let me tell you a story. Uh, this is a patient uh, in the Cooper ICU uh, in her late 30s. Uh, she had terrible, she was racked with terrible disease. She had worst ever lupus, worst ever vasculitis. Uh, she was in the unit because she'd had a perforated viscous. She had an open abdomen. She'd had multiple look surgeries. She was intubated. Her disease had wasted her to where she weighed less than 80 pounds. Uh, and she had two children in and around and less than age 10. And she wanted the tube out. Uh, because she was totally oriented times three, and she was a good patient. And at bedside rounds, the attending uh, would tell her, uh, we can't take it out. And she would say, what can I do? What can I do to help get this tube out? Well, um, when, when we decrease your ventilator support, you can try to relax, uh, don't breathe fast, uh, the various things that we can tell patients just uh, so that they feel like that they do have a potential. So the next day, the attending was rounding with that patient, uh, and she said, I want the tube out. And the attending said, we can't take it out. Uh, and she wrote voluminously on papers that she showed everyone. And this is what she wrote. She wrote, I did everything you asked me to and more. Why can't the tube come out? A poignant example of communication between a physician and a patient. and also makes you think compassionately about patients' needs. But what I think is even uh, more demonstrative of communication with patients uh, is the next issue that arose with that patient, which is it was clear that the tube was not coming out, that she would need to be trached. And there's sort of a reflex uh, you know, list of things we do when we trach patients that we think uh, you know may have a disease that they're never going to recover from, uh, that, that have a disease that may send them to the ventilator for the rest of their life, uh, which is to talk to them about aggressiveness of support. Uh, and you know that once you're trach, we may not be able to get you off the ventilator. Uh, and this discussion was had with this patient, not because the, uh, the team was pushing her for less than aggressive support. It's just that it felt like that the patient needed to know that. And here's what the patient wrote back uh, concerning that question. I will never, all caps underline, give up on life for my babies. We must do better. And I'd like to close with number one, uh, which is doing better with compassion in healthcare. 
Um, uh, compassion, deep awareness of the suffering of another accompanied by the wish to relieve it. It is generally accepted that intensivists have much more refined cognitive skills and technical skills than they have emotional skills. It is also recognized that we can learn and improve our emotional skills and our compassion in the ICU. And yes, we're getting pulled in all different directions, uh, but I think we have to take that step. The Dalai Lama said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. And I'm a personal testament to the power of that statement uh, because as I look back at my career uh, spanning 35 years, uh, I, I think I was an average compassion person, nothing special about my compassion. Uh, but over the last five years, uh, I have made a concentrated effort to hold more hands, to try to communicate with more patients, to try to talk with patients even briefly about things that are not related to their medical illness to communicate to them uh, that I care for them. Uh, and the payback for the patient, I, I believe, is large. Uh, but the payback for the physician and the health care provider is also large. Uh, I, get, I find that I think I get as much out of this as the patient. And for those of you that are much less far along in your career path, uh, I would urge you uh, to hold more hands, uh, to try to communicate with more patients, to try to understand more about your patients. And I'll close with this quote. Patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Thank you.